Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending the second conversation entitled A Big Price to Pay. This is a, a three-part virtual conversation series. So please mark your calendar for our third and final conversation, looking at the history of shared struggle for African and Asian American rights, which will take place next time, uh, this time next week, Wednesday, December 16th at 6 p.m. Pacific time. And if you have uh, not already donated to our campaign and are able to, please take a moment now to donate as generously as you can using the buttons below or by visiting our website at apilegaloutreach.org. This year has been really devastating on the communities that we serve and your contributions protect the services we provide to them. We're trying to raise $50,000 before the end of the year and appreciate anything that you can give. And as an extra incentive tonight, uh, if, you were, if you are to donate during this live event, uh, you will have a chance to win a curated gift box from our favorite Chinatown and Japantown small businesses. So we hope that we can um, ask you to donate um, as much as you can. And we also want to thank our event sponsors tonight. It's Davis Wright and Tremaine LLP and Perkins Coy LLP. Thank you very much for, for supporting us. And next to um, your video, you should uh, this video, you should see a chat area where, where you can communicate with us, the panelists, uh, the staff and the board members and other attendees. So please uh, sign into the chat as a guest, enter your name and say hello. Uh, we'll, we'll be taking your questions from the chat window during our question and answer session at the end. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our three panelists tonight. Uh, our first panelist that I'd like to introduce to you is Ryan Kimura. Ryan is a native San Franciscan. He's actually a fifth generation San Franciscan. And he is the owner of Pika Pika. It is a Japantown family owned business in the Kinokuniya Mall here in the Japan Center. Uh, Ryan has been a very active participant in the Japantown community. He's been uh, playing taiko since he has been able to walk. And um, his family has been a part of any and all events here in J-Town. Uh, Ryan is a member for Japantown for Justice and he was instrumental in helping us older folk um, kick off a great uh, campaign to support the ordinance to help small businesses. So hello, Ryan. My next uh, panelist that I'd like to introduce to you is Callie Wong. Callie is a San Francisco native as well. She is currently the director of the Asian Pacific Islander Council of San Francisco. Uh, Callie is the former senior district liaison for uh, board member Fiona Ma. And she was also the special assistant for the former state controller, John Chang. And last but not least is Alan Lowe. Alan is a partner, a lawyer and a partner at Perkins Coy. His area of specialty is in real estate. Uh, Alan was extremely instrumental in serving as a liaison between supervisors Preston and Peskin to help us uh, pass the ordinance, which was recently passed last week to help small businesses. Uh, Alan is also the vice president of the uh, Commission for Rec Recreation and Park and has served on numerous boards in, this, in San Francisco. So thank you panelists for joining us tonight. And I'm just gonna jump right in and I hope that the panelists will free to jump right in and, and um, insert your comments or feel free to ask all of us questions, including me. So my first question is going to be uh, geared toward Ryan. So Ryan, you you are a small business owner here in Japantown. I'm actually filming from Japantown and you uh, you are a part of a family business called Pika Pika. And this, this the products that Pika Pika uh, have tried to promote is something that has been very popular in Japan. And I know that you wanted to introduce that concept to the San Francisco audience. But what has it been like for you as a small business owner, um, you know, here in Japantown, here in a uh, an API cultural community and just um, anything you'd like to share about what has happened since the pandemic, since we have been told to be sheltering in place. Yeah, uh, thanks Diane for the question. I think first and foremost, I just wanna thank Apilo 
uh, for inviting me to be on this panel and giving me the space to just shed some light on the experiences of a small business owner in Japantown. Um, as far as what it's been like, it has been rough. Um, as my younger sister says, it's a struggle bus all the way through. Uh, since March 16th or 17th, we've been closed all the way through. Uh, we specialize in providing Japanese puriga, which are photo booths, right? It's all about the experience of going into the store and actively utilizing the photo booths. But unfortunately, what makes us so special also has led us to be closed for so long. Uh, we're kind of considered like an indoor family entertainment space. So we've been closed this whole time, uh, generating zero revenue, and it has been extremely challenging to say the least. So, um, you know, I think we get a lot of messages from our supporters. They want to see us open and as much as we would love to, uh, we do realize that there are safety measures put in place here in the city that don't allow us to open. So it's, it's been pretty tough. I'm sure it has been. Um, and, and just thank you for being around so long. How long have you been, how long has Pika Pika been around, Ryan? Uh, it's crazy to think that we've been around for 14 years now. So. Oh, uh, and you're only back in 2006. <laughs> I, yeah, Diane, right on. I like that. Yep. <laughs> okay, I, I'm going to gonna come back to you with more questions about um, just Pika Pika and just in, in terms of uh, your your place in the Japan Men, uh, Center malls later on. But I want to move on to Kelly and Kelly. You're you're kind of the face, the first face that people. Um, are able to talk to when we when they have questions uh, when uh, people in the Asian Pacific Islander community community uh, who are small business owners have questions about what to do um, you know they they own a small business and their landlord isn't responding to them and they're getting all these demands for rent or they're getting these demands to do all these different things and you just have to hear these these horrific and sad and sad stories every day I mean can you just Kind of share a little bit about um you know what what you've been hearing uh, has there been a change of um, focus and change of issues that have happened since we've been closed down since march to where we are today or just anything you'd like to share because um i know that everyone will come to you and and comes to you to ask for advice yeah it's been you know rough as well i think the term struggle bus is very adequate description, I think, for EK Council's members, all 56 nonprofits. It's been a struggle. It's been a struggle to stay open for our essential workers, you know, to come to work. In the beginning, it was very, very tough to acquire um, PPEs. A lot of our smaller nonprofits did not have the capacity or the money to even be able to acquire this. And at the same time, you know, businesses are shut down and we're seeing another wave currently that, you know, outdoor dining, indoor dining, everything's going to be shut down until January. And businesses and families are hurting, especially, you know, in our newcomer communities and our low-income communities and businesses that are, you know, cash only. We see it in the Tenderloin, we see it in Biz Valley, in Bayview, in Chinatown. And, you know, a lot of it is, I think it's great what Apilo and what you know Commissioner Lowe is doing for the community. Um, you hear a lot of small businesses saying like, "Hey, like this is new to us. It's very hard for us to, you know, approach a nonprofit or a law firm to ask for help." You have merchants who are or unwilling to disclose, you know, business records. It's 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 a foreign concept. So depending, you know, where in the city you are, I think there are different struggles, especially for our small, small businesses. Great, thank you for sharing that. And um, Alan, um, our go-to person, the person who helped uh, actually create the ordinance that was recently passed. Um, Ryan helped to create the campaign to get thousands of people to, uh, sign in and call and email our board of supervisors, but you're the one that actually wrote the law. So what does this this ordinance do now that it's passed? I mean, how does it really help small businesses? Can you give us some like really specific examples and particularly some examples that would really uh, pertain to the Asian Pacific Islander community? 
Thanks, Diane, and thank you to Pilo for highlighting this issue. Um, <clears throat> our work on the commercial eviction moratorium, moratorium ordinance is really designed to give small businesses a second chance. Um, rent is definitely the number one expense for these small businesses, both in Chinatown and Japantown. Um, in Chinatown, the expense represented about 70% of the fixed costs for these small businesses. And so what this ordinance is really trying to do is to give these small businesses a second chance. And there are terms that are dictated by the ordinance, um, depending on the size of the business. Um, most of these businesses are fall within what we call a tier one uh, category. Those tier one tenants uh, can defer the rent throughout the moratorium and repay that rent over a two-year period at once the moratorium is lifted. And the moratorium will extend and match the governor's uh, emergency order, which will run, currently runs to March 31, 2021. And if the governor extends it, so does the ordinance. Um, there's also a right for tier one tenants to terminate their lease. Um, but the uh, condition for that termination is the repayment of any back rent. And these are really um, what I call guardrails of, um, you know, the worst of two parties cannot agree. Uh, if the landlord and tenant cannot agree, these are really the default provisions uh, that will apply. The ordinance specifically encourages landlords and tenants um, to work out the problems because both landlords and tenants should realize that vacancy is, is not good for any commercial district or any shopping center. You can't have vacant stores. It doesn't, it hurts the tenants because it reduces the foot traffic. And for a landlord, it's expensive to have vacancies. Um, and, you know, I think in a perfect world, in an efficient marketplace, uh, two parties should be able to work within their self-interest to reach a deal. Um, in some cases, it's worked. Uh, in many cases, particularly in Japantown, where it's accentuated, it has not worked. And so what this ordinance really does is to provide guardrails in a default setting for when the landlord and the tenants cannot agree. So it's kind of like this foundation that um, you can start the conversation. Would, would that be a, a fair statement? Yeah, it, exactly. It's to um, be the backstop for the negotiations and in order to encourage landlord and tenants to work out their own deal. Um, there, the mayor had issued uh, previous emergency orders uh, the, to establish a commercial eviction moratorium. The only challenge to that was that they were very short term. Hopefully this ordinance provides uh, a clear path for tenants to move forward and hopefully to encourage landlords to work out a structure that will work for both parties. That's great. And thank you again for, for you and for Perkins Coy to, to take the lead in helping us out. Um, and I, I just have a question maybe for all of you and, and asking all of you to give your various viewpoints. You know, um, when we talk about uh, the struggle of small businesses and the, the real, real possibility of losing them, um, we're not just talking about a business. We're talking about um, a pillar of our cultural community that may be lost and may never have the chance to uh, be born again, to, to be able to survive again. And this is um, a very serious thing that we need to really let people know. I mean, I think uh, here in San Francisco or here in the Bay Area, we've just become very spoiled. You know, when we want ramen or when we want um, shalambao or when we want, um, you know, a great lumpia or adobo, we, we can get it. We just know where to go and we can get it. But but there is a real possibility that those things will no longer be available to us if our small businesses in our communities are forced to close. And I'm just wondering how we can share that thought and share that fear and share 
the very uh, important urgency to for for normal people, for everyday people to to realize this and to figure out how to support um, our communities. Would would any of you like to like comment on that? I don't know. Uh, I, I think we could hear it from all different angles and to hear about um, what you think would be ways in which we could get that word out. Brian? Yeah, I can chime in um, super quick. You know, just recently on our Instagram page, we posted that we were considering closing down for good, right? After 14 years. Um, now that post that we sent out earlier this week or last week has gotten the most comments, the most likes ever. And I think from that post, folks are realizing, holy, like this one shop that is the only shop the only shop that provides Japanese photo booths here in America um, might be closing down. And, you know, what we took for granted to your point, Diane, is going to be gone. Um, and, you know, I think it's it's tough. And, you know, we try to do our best as small businesses to encourage other folks to like shop local. Right. So this past weekend, you know, Black Friday, you know, shop local on Saturday. It was something that we were trying to push. Um, but even so, it's still challenging for sure. Kelly, did you want to comment? And then I, I also wanted to ask you, Kelly, um, you know, when we talk about small businesses in our API communities, we're, we're sometimes talking about, or, or many of the small business owners are first generation um, uh, people who have come here recently or who have been here a number of years and are still not familiar with these complex laws that surround small businesses, you know, how to get a license, how to um, you know, get a permit to create a bathroom in your business, you know, how to, how do I could paint my, my, uh, my outside of my building a certain color. I mean, all these things are so um, hard and, and challenging to understand to anyone, even a native English speaker who might have a law degree. Um, and it's, you know, it's especially challenging for those who uh, are just not familiar with the Western style of, of doing business. How how can we um, find ways in which we can offer more support or we as the general public or we as the API community offer more support and really uh, be able to um, offer, uh, you know, some very clear uh, solutions to them as, as they go through this very um, challenging time? Yeah, I think that's a great question, Diane. Um, I think one of the outcomes of COVID and being shelter in place is, you know, what we don't think about is when we don't support our small businesses, they will shut down. So it's very important that, you know, whether it's Black Friday every day or takeout, that you are going to, you know, your local restaurant, you're doing takeout, not from, you know, your big box, you know, fast food chains or whatever that may be. You know, in the beginning, it was hard enough to get small businesses, especially immigrant businesses, to even, you know, sign up and qualify for the PPP loan. And as we've seen, those who really benefited are actually those who may not really even need it. And I right. think another, you know, consequence is that, you know, our nonprofits are suffering. Our nonprofits, what we see, like a lot of our small nonprofits will actually be out of business. You know, not that nonprofits are businesses, but these are services that are essential for communities. These are nonprofits who are actually, you know, helping small businesses, you know, apply for a loan, how to navigate the city. And oftentimes that's the only avenue that folks get their resources. And, you know, entering with hotels being shut down, with revenue being down. As of, you know, today, the controller is um, expecting at least a uh, 160 million, you know, cut in the city's budget. And, you know, that goes to services like services to Apilo, providing legal services, senior services, meals, um, you name it. So it's definitely, it has an effect, you know, across the city. Right, right. Thank you. Alan, um, you know, we, we are in jeopardy of losing our cultural corridors, our our commercial quarters in our um, in our cultural communities. What what do you think? I mean, the ordinance is great because I really think without that, 
uh, many landlords would just hone in and start to send out eviction notices if they haven't already. But what do you think we could do kind of at a larger level um, to really figure out how we can maintain, promote, and preserve our cultural communities? Well, I think it's important to first recognize the premise that these communities of color are important in the context of the fabric of the neighborhoods and the communities. And we have to recognize that it's not just a small business, but they're small businesses that employ many people, many individuals in the community. They're small businesses that provide the stability of not just jobs, but also housing in the community. And there needs to be, um, I think, better advocacy and uh, data to promote and preserve these communities. Um, I think the uh, commercial eviction ordinance is just one tool that we have. It's really um, a tool for the short term while we get through this pandemic and this economic uh, calamity. Uh, it, I, I think it's time to look at whether there's land use tools that we can also utilize to try to keep these communities intact, um, as well as we need funding. Um, in, in the last round of, you know, to tee off of Callie's comment, the last round of PPP funding in Chinatown, less than a third of the business survey actually received PPP loans. So that, you know, that could be a lack of access to banks that were distributing the uh, PPP loans, could be a lack of understanding, applications in language. Um, they're just, the money wasn't going to those who are disproportionately affected. So I think it's, it's a combination of land use policies, advocacy, and funding. Yeah. And then, you know, I, I understand that there are a number of people who are listening to our conversation tonight, and I just want to figure out a way that we can uh, communicate with each and every one of them to let them know that um, they can, can contribute and they can help to protect these communities. And one of the ways is by just actually just shopping. But can you, can you name other things that can be done to... I mean, shopping and shopping and telling your friends through social media, but any other thoughts that you have? Um, you know, because of, uh, I, I hate to admit it, but I live in Japantown and I thought I knew all the businesses that were here, but it wasn't until um, Apilo started working with Perkins Coy and we went from business to business that I discovered all these new businesses and just um, how many years, how many decades these businesses have been able to be in this particular neighborhood. Um, some are as old as 50 years old. And, um, you know, they have always continued to support nonprofit organizations. And I just think that we in the nonprofit community need to now figure out ways to support them. Not to say that we don't need help, but, you know, just figure out other ways. Maybe it's not always financial, but other ways to support them. So, uh, you know, Ryan, you're I, I'm sure, Kelly, you're just as savvy, but I, I know Ryan's uh, very savvy social media techniques. And I'm just wondering, are there any other ways through social media that we could continue to promote our API communities and, and get folks to really understand that we need them to physically or uh, electronically tune into their stores and, you know, and help them out or at least give a shout out to say, hey, this is a great place to get you know, a bowl of noodles or to get the best uh, old fashioned, um, as my uncle Joe would say, uh, tomato beef chow mein in, in the world. You know, how can we do that? <laughs> yeah, I think, thanks Diane, to your point. Well, number one, uh, yeah, I love that tomato beef chow mein. Um, you gave me too much credit about the social media thing. I definitely rely, you know, that was a Japantown for Justice Coalition work. like. Without Japan Time for Justice, we would not have that huge social media push that we did in um, really campaigning for the small businesses within our city. Um, but you know, the other thing I do want to bring up to your point is what can folks do? 
honestly, there's a lot of small businesses out there that need assistance, even just in like learning how to properly use their social media. Okay. And I know there's a lot of folks out there that are just like gaming that social media. They know how to work it. They know when to post, they know what to post. A lot of small businesses would definitely benefit from learning from you. Okay. Um, for me, myself, I'm, uh, I'm on the edge of a millennial. I think I still don't really get all that Instagram stories and all that stuff, like how to generate a lot of likes. And I think we, as small businesses, could definitely use that help and assistance. So besides just, you know, spending um, cash and, you know, frequenting our stores, which is great, I think it's also providing some of your expertise in lending a helping hand for us. Great. I think those are really good points. Kelly, what do you think? You, you, hear, think you, you are our yeah, ears think, and you know what Ryan said, but I want to add, you know, another way that folks can really help out is actually, you know, maybe volunteer at your local nonprofit, uh, volunteer to deliver meals to seniors. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. We all nonprofits uh, have been forced to shut down. I mean, some have been able to do some virtual um, events this year, but it's been very hard. So yeah, they could really use the, the volunteer power to, to sustain them. And, and I'm not sure how long we're going to be in this state, so it would be great. Alan, did you have any thoughts um, kind of looking at it from a, a non a non nonprofit eye? <laughs> Does that make well, sense? Um, non nonprofit. It seems like what's happening in the for profit world as well. Um, but I do think. Um, from a more systematic approach, uh, I do think that the impacts of COVID-19 on Asian American communities, on um, both in terms of small businesses, on um, impacts on delivery of health services, on employment has been grossly underreported and you know, I think if you dig deeper, you will find a disproportionate impact of the COVID-19 crisis on Asian American communities. So I do think that there is a call for, you know, Chinatown, Japantown, Soma, really to come together and to really advocate to bring more attention to these issues. Um, because there, if, if you, look at the data, the data will show a disproportionate effect that occurs, you know, in these communities. Um, take a walk down Chinatown, look at the number of empty stores. It, it's heartbreaking. And these are communities that we need to preserve because it's such an important, um, it's such an important opportunity, not just for you know new immigrants who have again been disproportionately affected by small business closures, but it's also important because this is really the fabric of San Francisco. And if we want to come out of this and recognize the city that we love, we got to do something to bring attention to preserve these communities. Yes, I agree. And um, I'm seeing a question that I'd like to ask all of you to uh, think about answering. The question is, Shopping local is important, but I don't think it's the entire answer. How can we push for institutional systematic policies that will support small businesses? Any one of you want to jump in first? Um, I'll take I'll take a stab at it. I think uh, oh. first of all, it it requires a federal stimulus package targeted to small businesses. You know, we can't have the Kushner companies get, you know, government assistance. It has to be pika pika. It has to be the true small businesses that we have to save. So first, it, it, a, a solution has to come from the federal level. I think the financial institutions uh, should also be encouraged to provide this relief because this is an entire ecosystem. And you know, I think Washington or the Federal Reserve has to step in to encourage financial institutions to make accommodations to landlords uh, in order to 
um, make concessions to tenants. You know, is there a tax credit relief here as well? You know, if a landlord provides rent concessions to the tenant, can they get some sort of uh, tax credit, you know, over a period of time? That might be a solution. Um, and, you know, really, we have to encourage uh, landlords and tenants to work together in different means in order to make the the small businesses stay intact and be a fabric of the community. And, you know, I also don't want to leave out housing. Housing is such a crucial element to this as well. Um, you know, you can look at the, the tenant uh, protections that we have in San Francisco, we're fortunate, but that's not the case throughout the Bay Area. And there will be tenant displacements, uh, which is just gonna be heartbreaking if people start to lo lose their homes. So we really have to take a look at how to stabilize small businesses. Um, we have to house, stabilize housing and stabilize our communities. Yeah, I agree, I totally agree. Kelly or Ryan, did you want to make uh, some comments or add to that? If not, I was I'm just going to go jump on. in. It, go ahead, please. Sorry, Dan. No, I was just going to piggyback off of, what, off of what Alan said. I think it's important that um, there are some incentives to landlords in providing some relief to their tenants, right? I, I think uh, I'll just speak from my own personal experience, right? My small business, it's like, uh, it's my heart's in it. Right, so we do it for the love of it, and I think a lot of you know what you'll find is a lot of small businesses run that way. We do it because, like, shoot, that's what we know. It's like our kid, and so we've seen it grow, and we want to see it push forward, and that's the attachment level of attachment we have to it. Now, are there landlords that feel the same way about tenants? Probably not, you know. Um, and so, what is it that we can do to really push landlords to start to think creatively? in providing some sort of supports and relief for uh, small businesses. I think that's key, it's huge. Right, okay, thank you. Um, um, I'm gonna move on to the next question. And the next question is, do you see San Francisco small businesses play a role of helping businesses with CBOs in navigating how to survive or, in, or identify or an identify group to, or identify a group to provide technical assistance? Yeah, I, I can take that one, um, right. Diane. I think, you know, we can see maybe more of a partnership with SF Small Business or even with, you know, SF Chamber of Commerce working with our ethnic small businesses. I think oftentimes, even during COVID of who gets tested, who's dying at a higher rate, I think APIs are often overlooked. Um, they're we're often perceived as the model minority. We're often forgotten whether education, small businesses, schools, whatever that may be. And I think in, you know, this situation, it's, it's no different. Even when, you know, the PPPs were coming out, you know, even for, you know, all 56 of my members, it was so hard to even find a bank that was willing to help them. Yeah. Um, I think there needs to be a better partnership with perhaps identifying banks, because apparently the banks had a quota, you know, how many other small businesses, merchants to work with. And, you know, it's really up to them who they want to pick. And, you know, for our small businesses, I know on API Council's end, we actually had a generous donor from the community who actually, you know, made a generous donation to a nonprofit to actually reach out to small merchants and, hey, this is what you have to do. This is free money, please apply. And even that was very foreign to a lot of our um, community members and merchants. So I think, you know, working with the city and having the city be willing to, you know, work with us is essential. Yeah, I, I think you're you're totally right. And um, I just want to kind of um, add to that comment and do a little self-promotion. Uh, the San Francisco, San Francisco has a small business re legacy program and um, small businesses are eligible to receive grants. So if you're a landlord, you could receive grants uh, to do some upgrades of your facility if you are willing to sign a lease for a certain amount of years. And if you are a tenant, you are able to receive a grant uh, depending on the number of employees that you have. And um, 
The Legacy Business uh, Program is open to all small businesses in the city and county of San Francisco, but we often see very few uh, businesses in the API community. Um, and there are a number of reasons for that. Number one, they don't know about it. Number two, they feel that it's too daunting to you know, go to their city supervisor or go to the mayor's office to be nominated. But here's uh, another example of something that is uh, freely available to any small business that has been around for at least 30 years. And many of our API businesses have been around for at least that long. Uh, in Chinatown, on Clement Street, on Judah Street, in Japantown, um, that would be, you know, very eligible to apply. So I'm, I'm hoping that um, through word of mouth and maybe through the API Council and maybe through people hearing this panel discussion today, that they'll spread the word that that is also a um, program that is available to them. Um, did anybody else want to comment on on that last question? Yeah, um, just to pick up on something Kelly said, you know, the distribution of PPP loans really highlight, highlights a lack of access to capital. And um, many of the community banks who were charged with the um, disbursement of PPP loans uh, only went to existing clients. And if you were if you didn't have a bank account at Wells Fargo or Chase, many times you were you were shut out from getting assistance. So to answer, you know, what one of the questions there is: How can small businesses or financial institutions partner uh, with the community? One way is to make sure that the community banks and financial institutions are making these this financial assistance available to small businesses. Um, I also want to point out that what was an encouraging uh, development, which Kelly touched upon, was there were donations coming to um, feed the community. And there was a good partnership where small businesses, particularly restaurants, were delivering meals to seniors. You know, can we create and become more creative to develop programs like that between the nonprofit community and small businesses to survive and uh, help not only feed, but have our communities thrive. That is a positive development, which we should build upon. Yeah, yeah. And kind of um, the, the next question that just came in kind of talks about that. How can diverse ethnic communities work together to preserve small businesses and cultural enclaves in the midst of the crisis and restructuring occurring during the pandemic? Anybody want to start that conversation? How do we work together? Ryan, you well, want to start I, that conversation? Or I, go I, ahead, Al. No, I was, I was about to, to, I was to highlight the great work that Ryan did on the commercial yeah. eviction ordinance. Um, I think it was a great um, effort by Ryan and Japantown for Justice and the Rose Pack Democratic Club to come together. As, a, as communities to really advocate for this ordinance. And I think that should be a start where Asian American communities and Afri advocacy groups come together as one to really uh, produce the data for the policymakers to advocate to the Board of Supervisors and to the mayor and to the uh, Sacramento and Washington DC to highlight that this is a problem. And I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, the coalition that was started to build for the commercial eviction moratorium ordinance will continue so that we could bring broader relief. Right, right, I totally agree because um, I, I don't know how many thousands of people, individuals were willing to sign that campaign to show their support for the ordinance. But Ryan, did you want to talk a little bit about um, the Japantown for Justice, why it started. Um, I can just give you a maybe start that conversation by telling you uh, or telling the audience, and many probably already know that um, San Francisco Japantown um, during the war, uh, you know, all the Japanese Americans who were residing here, over 8,000 of them were forced to. Uh, go to concentration camps in very desolate parts of the United States. And when they came back to their homes in Japantown, there were many 
African American families who were living here. And um, so the Fillmore, the Western Edition, Japantown, became a very diverse community where you had African American families and Japanese American families living together. And um, you, you know, just with gentrification and just the crazy cost of living here, we're starting to see just the the African American community shrink to like barely nothing. But when um, the whole Black Lives Matter uh, issue came up, um, a lot of folks in uh, young young folks like Ryan in Japantown thought that this was the most opportune moment to reach out. And so I'll let you continue that, Ryan. Uh, thanks for that, Diane. Uh, yeah, you know, I think um, big shout out to Japantown for Justice, uh, Jay for Jay. What are we all about? Just so we know, um, I'm privileged enough to be a part of the group. Uh, somehow they let me in, but we're really looking to um, dismantle systemic in inequity and really promote sovereignty and cultural sovereignty in the Fillmore and Japantown. Uh, it sounds like a lot, but really what we're trying to do is like build coalitions between Japantown and the Fillmore and see how we can help each other. And to Alan's point, it's all about coalition building, right? And I would say, I don't know, I think it's since June of this year, um, a handful of us uh, leaders within the community within Japantown have reached out to leaders within the Fillmore and seeing like, what can we do to work together to lift, lift each other up and fully support each other? And you know, what's come out of that? Um, we've created, uh, the coalition has created what we call the Fillmore Marketplace, which is a space um, on Sundays where we provide, we close off a street and we provide spaces for local businesses to set up shop because you know maybe they had to close down their own uh, brick and mortars, but they can set up their tents and openly uh, sell their goods. And you know that's a, a direct way to support. Um, that's just a little bit of the work that Japan Town for Justice does. You know, moving forward, we really look to. Uh, work in providing educational opportunities on how we are going to dismantle anti-blackness, right? And how we are going to address anti-blackness because that is definitely a thing. Um, now I realize I'm going all over the place, but to go back to the previous question, when it comes to what can we do uh, in terms of bridging our diverse communities, uh, it really takes a ton of energy, right? And I think let's be very clear, um, a lot of these small businesses, they are struggling just to make it day to day, right? So to ask them to, hey, can you sign this letter to send it to a supervisor? That is just one more thing on their plate that could just break their back. I know it sounds so simple to us right here, but that's a lot. When you're having to worry about how am I going to feed my kids? How am I going to feed my family when no one's coming to my business, when I can't even open my business? So I think... Um, what we really need to do as a community, all of us here, is really come together and feel, and figure out you know, how we can organize and who has the capacity to do so, and how can we make sure that we're taking care of each other so we're not burning out in the process. Right, right. And this time when we come together, it's just not the nonprofits. It's clearly uh, a, com uh, a more inclusive, I think, community where business now is uh, seen as a very important not to say that they weren't, but it's just that we had these silos going. And I think, um, you know, because of the pandemic, we were, that's probably the only fortunate thing, break down those silos just to see how important um, both both sides of, of that, uh, of those silos are, nonprofits as well as small businesses. I have another question that is popping up. Uh, what is the next step for the Save San Francisco Small Business Campaign? Has the commercial eviction ordinance been useful, a useful leverage tool to bring property owners to the table so that small businesses can discuss lease agreements? I think I'll have Alan start that one. Um, thanks, Diane. The ordinance uh, was just passed by the Board of Supervisors on December 1st, um, and the mayor has yet to sign the ordinance. Um, so it's not quite effective yet, uh, but since it was adopted by the Board of Supervisors, it has uh, restarted discussions with some landlords, in particular for Kinakunia Mall and for the East and West Malls in Japantown. So it, it is bringing um, landlord, landlords to the table. 
There's still an education process, frankly, that still needs to occur to make sure that there's an understanding of the need to preserve tenants. As crazy as that sounds, um, it's still one of the major hurdles in getting to an agreement is keeping tenants in place um, and uh, having both the landlords and the tenants agree that yes, it's important to keep a tenant in place um, in order for both sides and that should be the motivation to figure out a solution to this pandemic. And um, it's helped, it's, it started discussions and it's been helpful, uh, but the education is still ongoing. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Um, I have a question that just popped up that I is uh, specifically, I think, uh, addressed to Ryan. And the question is, Pika Pika is such a neighborhood treasure. And my friends have wanted to know how to donate, support the business. How can we do this? Uh, just write oh, a man. This is a That'll do it. <laughs> uh but yeah blank checks uh man this one hits my heart uh well first off yeah well i'm, I'm glad to hear that this this commenter thinks that pika pika is such a neighborhood treasure i don't think we ever really thought of our business in that sense we just thought it was a fun place to go but um as far as how you all can support uh definitely like and share our posts our social media posts because really that's the main way that we're getting communication out um you can see from my instagram post that we are strongly considering just shutting it down all right so what would that include well that might include we would have to sell our machines so hey if you are interested in having a 10 by 8 japanese photo booth in your living room hit me up okay uh but i i think um besides that though really my big call to action for everyone out there is I'm glad that you love Pika Pika, um, but realize that we're just a small piece of this larger community. So I need for this person and for everyone else to jump in and really support all the other small businesses and all the nonprofits that are there, like keeping this ecosystem moving. Great. Thank you, Ryan. So um, I am seeing on my screen that we're uh, starting to uh, move toward the end of our conversation. And I just wanted to see if all of you would like to um, leave uh, a closing statement before uh, we have to start closing out. Uh, so I, Ryan, since you, you are right in front of me, if you wanna <laughs> give some, wait, I have a comment. Let's see, uh, do the panelists know that their fire is spreading? Our staff have gotten calls from small businesses in cultural districts elsewhere in the Bay Area and even LA to try to initiate similar efforts. Wow, that's great. Uh, and that's what we wanted. We wanted, well, actually, Alan, Alan worked a lot with uh, folks in Little Tokyo and Los Angeles, right? And then to try to start the conversation with the supervisors here to create the language. But uh, this is really wonderful news. And um, I credit all of you on the panel for helping to uh, be the advocates for this. But Anybody want to make a comment about that, about spreading the fire in a good way? I'm say hell yeah to that. I'm like, I'm so glad that that's what happened because, you know, like I, there were countless nights, you know, okay, here we go. I'm going to go off a but big ups to Diane, big ups to Alan, Apilo, Perkins Cooley, just for like coming together to lead this campaign and help us with this campaign. Uh, I don't know how many nights we stayed up texting each other, like, what are we going to do, right? How are we going to rally? And so I'm glad you all feel this fire. Yeah. Right? So like, like my deal is like, keep it moving and keep it going. And we are here to support you all the way. <sighs> Kelly or Alan, you want to comment on that? I mean, this is, this is really uh, a rewarding comment, I think, to all of you. I'll let yeah, Kelly go I first. A shout out to Alan, Dean, and you, Diane, for really leading the effort in this. Because prior to Alan and Dean, like we really didn't have, at least on my end, I didn't really have anywhere for clients and members to go to for legal assistance. And, you know, we had, you know, 
different nonprofits who are already helping small businesses and doing small business assistance. But I think with COVID and this has taken it to a whole new level. So, you know, props to, you know, Dean, you and Alan. And I know Alan, just anytime a nonprofit needs anything, Alan is always the first to volunteer himself or to actually most of the time initiate. So thank you so much, Alan, for your time, uh, generous time, whether it's, you know, donations, whatever it is, just, you know, thank you. Oh, uh, well, you know, I'd like to um, call it getting into good trouble as the late Representative Lewis uh, would say, but um, I think the closing thought is this is such an important issue to me to keep the fabric of the city together while we go through this pandemic. And um, we have to do what we can. We have, we're starting to have the tools that we can utilize to keep the communities together, either through more affordable housing, the Community Opportunity Purchase Act to purchase, um, you know, rent control departments to keep people in place, the commercial eviction moratorium ordinance. We've got great ideas coming out of Sacramento uh, to try to assist landlords and tenants in keeping uh, businesses intact and um, really keeping the fabric of our communities in place. Um, and so I'm hopeful that the San Francisco that I knew before the shelter in place will still be there when we come out of the shelter in place. And it's just for the love of the city and the love of Chinatown and Japantown. Um, I just hope that we can all come together and advocate for our communities to keep them intact so that there will continue to be an opportunity for new immigrants and as Ryan, Ryan and his sister Aaron taught me for you know generations more to come to keep that cultural tie to these districts. So I thank you everyone for spreading the word and there's plenty of room on the team for help and um, to help out and you know, just keep the fire going. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And thank you all for your closing thoughts. Um, I think all your comments were, were really great. And I think all of us um, who are listening today learned a lot. And I just um, wanted to uh, give some closing points. Uh, I see Dean has popped up on the screen, but wanted to thank all of you for attending tonight's virtual conversation and supporting the Asian Pacific Islander Legal Outreach and our local ethnic small businesses. Uh, this video recording will be available for viewing immediately after we end tonight's program on the same web page. If you have not already donated to our campaign and are able to, please take a moment now to donate as generously as you can using the buttons below. And please mark your calendars for this time next week, December 16th at 6 p.m. Pacific time when we're gonna have our closeout of our conversation entitled Rebuilding the Dream. Uh, it's going to uh, talk about the shared struggles uh, with the African-American community and the Asian-American community and their experience during their fights for civil rights. And more inf information about that will be available on our events page uh, on our website or by subscribing to our email or social media. Just wanted to leave you with two thoughts. Um, number one, um, please don't forget our small businesses. If if you leave uh, with anything else from tonight's discussion, um, please don't take them for granted. Please, uh, please shop, please buy, please uh, buy online or please uh, venture out if you can and, and be part of that 20% and waiting in line to uh, visit your local store. I think that that would be really, really helpful. And the second thing is that um, many of you on this panel probably helped us get the media um, attention that we needed uh, during the campaign. And we really appreciate you, you um, doing that and spreading the word about what we've been trying to do in uh, our API communities. And we thank you for that and to continue to keep that fire going because we still have a long road ahead of us. And I'm going to now turn it over to Dean Ito Taylor, the Executive Director of API Legal Outreach. Thank you, Diane. And I wanna thank all the participants of tonight's conversation. 
you know, Kelly, uh, the director of the API Council, really stepped up uh, when the pandemic started and said to us, you know, what can the API Council do to help not only nonprofits, but small businesses and other people that were suffering in the API community? And she spearheaded the effort to co-sponsor our legal, legal clinics uh, that helps uh, not only folks, individuals that are seeking uh, uh, assistance with uh, unemployment and uh, those types of issues, but also small businesses and nonprofits, uh, especially those seeking help with PPP applications and, and the like. So thank you, Kelly and the API Council for all your support. Alan, uh, famous attorney in the Bay Area, um, as always at the heart of pro bono efforts on behalf of the community and those people that uh, can't afford uh, to uh, pay for private counsel. And you know, like if somebody from ABI Legal Outreach calls a landlord, you know, they're gonna get some, some, uh, some respect because we're, we're representing clients. But when Alan calls, they have to drop everything and talk to him. So it's really essential that, you know, uh, somebody as high powered as Alan and the Perkins firm uh, is willing to step up and, and offer a volunteer assistance to uh, folks in need. Uh, I, I say my comments for Ryan to last because it's really, not only is it difficult to be a small business owner in an ethnic community uh, during the last eight months, but it's also very difficult for Ryan and somebody who is a small business owner to stand up against, uh, you know, what possibly uh, uh, landlords are doing or, or the political situation that is not supportive of, of small businesses. And Ryan has taken that bold and brave step of being a representative on behalf of small merchants, especially um, uh, small merchants that may not be familiar with, with the local ordinances and laws and may not have English as a first language. And so thank you, Ryan, for taking that leadership position because really it, it's about you know you guys uh, leading us to, you know, uh, to make things better for small businesses in our communities. And really, the, 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 our communities are, are the heart and soul of San Francisco and the Bay Area, whether it's Soma Filipinas or Little Saigon, Chinatown, Japantown, uh, Hunters Point, you know, the Fillmore. Uh, those ethnic communities are, are, are vital to, to the identity of, of California and, and the Bay Area. And we hope that you all who have joined us tonight can continue to push forward with local protections. When we ask for advocacy, you all have stepped up and helped us. Uh, when we ask for support for federal and state assistance, you all have stepped up to help us. Those efforts are gonna have to continue for the next year, uh, if not longer. Uh, the, the eviction moratorium that Alan was so instrumental in getting passed locally will expire in March. but we are afraid that small businesses are not going to be able to uh, just suddenly revive in March. And we may have to seek uh, uh, an extension of, of that moratorium. And finally, you know, it, all small businesses are suffering in the state and in the country, but it's particularly hard on our ethnic communities uh, and, and the small businesses in our cultural districts. So there is an, an exception there that really needs to be looked at that where we have to preserve uh, make that exception and preserve our, our, our ethnic communities. Thank you again for joining us tonight. Thank you for supporting API Legal Outreach and the folks that, that, you, that you listen to tonight. And we hope to see you at our program next week. Good night.